ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಾಗವತಂ ಕಂಟೋ ಫೈವ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಏಟ್ ಟೆಕ್ಸ್ ಟೆನ್ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಲೇಷನ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಕಾಮೆಂಟ್ರಿ ಬೈ ಹಿಸ್ ಡಿವೈನ್ ಗ್ರೈಸ್ ಐ ಸಿ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವೈರಾಂಥ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಪ್ರಭುಪಾದ್ ನೂನಂಹಿಯ ಸಾಧವ ಉಪಶಮ ಶೀಲ ಕೃಪಣ ಸುಹೃದ ಏವಂ ವಿಧಾರ್ಥೆ ಸ್ವಾರ್ಥಾನ್ ಅಪಿ ಗುರುತರಾನ್ ಉಪೇಕ್ಷಂತೆ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಲೇಷನ್ even though one is in the renounced order one who is advanced certainly feels compassion for suffering living entities one should certainly neglect his own personal interests although they may be very important to protect one who has surrendered purport maya is very strong in the name of philanthropy altruism and communism people are feeling compassion for suffering humanity throughout the world philanthropists and altruists do not realize that it is impossible to improve people's material conditions material conditions are are already established by the superior administration according to one's karma they cannot be they cannot be changed the only benefit we can render to suffering beings is to try to raise them to spiritual consciousness material comforts cannot be increased or decreased it is therefore said in shrimad bhagavatam tal labhyate dukhavad anyata sukham as far as material happiness is concerned that comes without effort just as tribulations come without effort material happiness and pain can be attained without endeavor one should not bother for material activities if one is at all sympathetic or able to do good to others he should endeavor to raise people to krishna consciousness in this way everyone advances spiritually by the grace of the lord for our instruction bharat maharaj acted in such a way we should be very careful not to be misled by so called welfare activities conducted in bodily terms one should not give up his interest in attaining the favor of lord vishnu at any cost generally people do not know this or they forget it consequently they sacrifice their original interest the attainment of vishnu's favor and eng- and engage in philanthropic activities for bodily comfort this which is stated here even though one is in the renounced order one who is advanced certainly feels compassion for suffer- suffering living entities one should certainly neglect his own personal interests although they may be very important to protect one who has surrendered this statement is very good <laughs> but it's if misapplied it can be the cause not of elevation as one might think but of degradation it's similar in that sense to arjuna's arguments which were very good arguments but they were applied in such a way that they his arjuna's statements were made in the background of his own personal attachment and so although what he spoke was very good the practical application of it would be that he, he would continue being in the maya that had impelled him to make such statements as shila prabhupad writes here another of those Shila Prabhupada aphorisms maya is very strong short sentence just uh, a few verses previously another similar aphorism of shila prabhupad 
Śrīla Prabhupāda writes, the laws of nature work in subtle ways unknown to us. <laughs> so here we have an example of Bharat Maharaj thinking in a very noble way. He didn't give up his Krishna conscious philosophy or his understanding that had impelled him to leave everything. When we say someone leaves everything, he left everything and went to the forest. Well, for some people, everything might mean a, a little hut and a few kitchen utensils and not much else. But for Bharat Maharaj, it meant everything, the whole planet, really meant everything. So he left everything and went to the forest because he understood that we have to be Krishna conscious. Maya is very strong. Bharat Maharaj already understood that. Maya is very strong. So to get away from that Maya, he went to the forest. And it's not just a matter of going to the forest and doing some bird watching or something like that, but engaging in severe austerity so that even though in the forest there's especially if you're alone, there's very little opportunity for any sense gratification. So that's already a big start on the, pla on the path of self-realization, but he engaged in severe austerities also to, in an effort to purge out even the slightest trace of any desire for sense gratification. Desire comes in various phases. There's the, within the consciousness, deep consciousness, this mm, Sigmund Freud, he made some analysis of the subconsciousness, but this was already, he, he brought into the Western way of thinking. He's been extremely influential in Western thinking. Sigmund Freud's uh, ideas about, or analysis of the mind. So he talks about the subconsciousness, but that's already analyzed in Vedic psychology that there, there's the chitta within which the, the consciousness within which there is, there are sanskars or impressions literally means impre impressions, which we may be, we're mostly unaware of, but from the, the sum total of these sangskaras mixed in a, in a complicated way with karma or the, the, the general desire to enjoy this world, icha dvesha sabud, mixed with icha and dvesha, general desire and general feeling of animosity towards others. When the, these are mixed, then these emerge as various uh, vasanas or general tendencies. And then, uh, and then specific desires. One, one may have a general tendency, for instance, to, uh, one may have, or every, every, everyone in this world has the, the tendency to enjoy interactions with the opposite sex, and that becomes a specific desire when one happens to meet a member of the opposite sex, unless one is self-realized, as you were saying yesterday. Srila Prabhupada's miracle his, that is that what he could do, floating in the air. Srila Prabhupada didn't do such things. Well, he did sometimes on a, to a, on a small scale, but he didn't make a big show of it. Uh, but the ability to be with beautiful women and not have the desire to enjoy them, it's very rare. So, uh, these subtle desires um, that in Bharatma, Bharat Maharaj, the desire still to uh, 
enjoy, enjoy it, came to the enjoy, not in a very gross way, but to be the noble protector, in this case of a deer. As in his role as a king, a pious king assumes the role not of a despot persecuting the citizens, but in the role of a strict and kind, like, like a strict and kind father. And in this way, he's the protector of the citizens. And that is his maya. He may do it on behalf of the Supreme Lord. Ishvara Bhava. This is one of the qualities, essential quality of a kshatriya, which is listed by Krishna in Bhagavad Gita. Ishvara Bhava. The feeling that I'm in control here. He has to do that on behalf of the Supreme Lord. But still, uh, if it's not fully purified, then that tendency to, to want to benefit others, that can uh, drag one down also. The Varnashram system is for, uh, has various uh, salutary effects, one of which is that it gives a, uh, a channel for people to take their material desires and engage in activities and in this way serve Krishna. And therefore, svakaramana uh, tamabhyacha siddhing vindati manavaha. Every person, every human, every man can attain perfection by performing one's, his own prescribed duties within Varnashram and worshipping him, Ishra, the real Ishra, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But at the same time, one has to understand what is Maya. Otherwise, simply by doing one's prescribed duties, Without the worship, without worshiping Krishna, then uh, one falls into Maya, and that's the problem. Although the, as Srila Prabhupada sometimes said, actually the caste system was very good in many ways. Caste system by birth, in many had many advantages. There was no unemployment. There was no. There was no uh, insecurity as to what you would do in future. It was already chalked out for you. You may say, well, that doesn't give you the freedom and this and that. Uh, but there's no need for a useless, massive school system when most people, even today, everyone goes to school, but most people, it, it, for what they do later in life, it's superficial. It's going to school for 10 years, doesn't help the auto rickshaw driver at all. Well, maybe you can read the signs, but then most of the signs are pictograms anyway. And in India, if you have signs on the road, what are you going to do in Bangalore? You need them in five languages at least. <laughs> so, there are many advantages to that. Uh, and it is stressed throughout Shastra, but then if you miss the point, tamabhyacha siddhim vindati manava, that by one's work one is supposed to worship Krishna and become purified, then you miss the whole point. Therefore, dharma svanushtita pungsa vishvaksena katasu yaha nukpadiyad yadiratim shrama evahi kevalam. Without developing a taste for hearing about Krishna, then all the work is, everything you do is useless. Uh, ultimately, it's useless. So, uh, Maya is very strong. Bharat Maharaj, even though he had become so, uh, he was so committed to overcoming Maya and to becoming Krishna conscious. Many people, they only get half the equation, and therefore they don't get anything. They, they think they just want to get free of maya, but they don't think that we have to worship, that, that, that the goal of life is to worship Krishna. 
and for them aruha krishna parang padang tatam adant patantyato nadrata yushvarangra they they go up with a lot of trouble they go up to the spiritual sphere but they fall down again due to not worshiping krishna so bharat maharaj had the formula right and he was executing it in all seriousness and was doing well but maya is very strong and so he's he's thinking here the same philosophy the right philosophy but he's misapplied it one should certainly neglect his own personal interests although they may be very important to protect one who has surrendered that is true for a kshatriya and the great example of that is ranti deva who even the the buddhists quote him they may they turned him into a bodhisattva you know that he's a, an example of one who sacrificed for the benefit of others the, the hawk and the dove who were indra and who else brahma so who had come and uh ranti dev as the great philanthropist and the protector of the citizens he he uh, as the dove took shelter of the king and, the, and said protect me and the king said okay i'm here to protect you and the hawk said well what about me i'm your citizen also and that's my food so you have to you have to give me the dove so the king said well okay i'll give you my the weight of my own body in exchange so he cut off part of his body put it on the weighing scale and it wasn't heavy enough so he cut off more cut off more cut off more and still it wasn't heavy enough so he put his whole body on the weighing scale which is a nice sentiment but if any of his ministers had been there they'd have said don't do that you can't sacrifice your life for the sake of a hawk you have a more important thing to do as a king to to protect all the to to fulfill the desire of this hawk then you'll put the whole kingdom into jeopardy but anyway the the idea is there that the king he can give up his own personal interests to protect those who are surrendered so that is a kshatriya principle and many a fine kshatriya has nobly died and happily died sukinam what is that sukina kshatriya patha labante yuddham idrisham they've happily died on the battlefield knowing that uh, by doing so swaga dwaram apavritam the gates of heaven are open so this is a kshatriya duty to neglect your own personal interests you may die even but you have to protect others but when this is applied that to this principle that the swartha gati the goal of our self interest is vishnu then you got the muddled up then you got the philosophy wrong i can give up my krishna consciousness to protect someone who is dependent requiring we often see people are compromised because of that there are many examples of that i first saw shrila prabhupad's books they were shown to me by my best friend at school i must have been about 16 or 17 years old and he said i went to london at the weekend i got these books and he showed them to me eagerly and i said ah indian swami is they're all cheaters i don't want anything to do with that that was my first time i saw prabhupad's books i didn't take i didn't look at them but he was very interested and he later got more books and and uh then i joined the movement and he said i can't join because he had i don't know about eight or nine or 10 sisters and he was the only son he was the eldest and his father was a he was an irish bricklayer which means he was a drunkard and he spent all his money on beer normal irish family in england so he thought i have to look at and his eldest sister at the age of 14 made his parents uh, uh, grandparents uh so he thought i have to look after the family he was interested but i lost contact and there are many many examples like this of people who for the sake of the family or whatever they have to now 
it is a uh, it can be a tricky point how to advise people because we also don't want in the name of Krishna conscious that people should become irresponsible and just whimsically give up family duties especially if they are uh, parents with dependent children so the, there are various considerations but one should hear this this Bharat Maharaj one should he says he should one should certainly neglect his own personal interests to protect one who has surrendered but one should know what is one's personal interest first of all what is one's deepest and actually what the real personal interest by sacrificing one's personal interest on the material platform to benefit others uh, one acquires punya to sacrifice one's own personal interest to help uplift others spiritually for instance uh, you might like to sit at home peacefully but instead you go out and distribute Srila Prabhupada's books and you may have to in the western countries it used to be uh, quite often that devotees would get uh, insulted, physically assaulted, arrested for distributing Srila Prabhupada's books, but devotees would do so for the benefit of others, out of compassion for others. And here in India also one, one may have to, uh, especially in the heat of the summer, can be very difficult. Um, but even though it's very difficult, one may neglect one's own personal bodily comfort to help others by bringing Krishna consciousness to them. And one is favored by Krishna for doing so. Krishna is pleased by doing that. But if we think that I have to neglect my Krishna consciousness to help others on the material platform, it's a very tenuous position. And here Srila Prabhupada develops the theme of how Bharat Maharaj has misinterpreted the philosophy. It's actually a misinterpretation of the philosophy which looks very good and very saintly and Bharat Maharaj, he thought he was being very saintly by doing so, but there was, it was a, the right philosophy but misapplied and as a result he didn't stop being Krishna conscious, but his Krishna conscious was interrupted. And Srila Prabhupada develops this theme by talking about philanthropy, altruism, which is similar to philanthropy. Well, philanthropy is one aspect of altruism, and communism. Now, this is... Uh, certainly relevant to our ISKCON movement at the present time, in which uh, in certain sectors of our movement or certain branches, there's a lot of emphasis on bodily welfare activities. We have to be very careful. The aim may be ultimately to serve Krishna. But we have to be very careful not to be diverted and or to divert others. Srila Bhakti Siddhan Sarasar Thakur stated in this regard that the ringing of the bell in the temple during the arati by a neophyte devotee helps people in all ways millions and millions of times both materially and spiritually even materially it helps them more uh, than by opening innumerable hospitals, schools and so on now this might seem very difficult to understand, ringing the bell. It's deliberately given as a, 
as an example of a very ordinary activity that can easily be done. Maybe it seem to be very ordinary, I mean, ringing a bell, so what? But it is extraordinary because it is executed for the pleasure of Krishna. Whereas activities which are much more difficult to perform, such as opening and hospitals and, op- and running hospitals, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, it requires much effort and it, it seems to have much more benefit. I mean, it's tangible that people go into the hospital sick and they come out healthy. Of course, some of them come out dead also, but you can't blame that on the hospital in every instance. In many instances, actually, they they give the wrong medicine or they mix up the records and give the treatment to someone who's meant for someone else and so on. That happened with Sri Devi's mother. You remember that? Sri De- Anyone remember the name of Sri Devi? The Iyengar actress from Chennai who became a Bollywood heroine? Forgotten. Largely for the new generation won't have heard of her because she's not beautiful anymore. It happens to every beautiful young woman if they don't die young, like Marilyn Monroe. Uh, so she sent her mother to America for treatment and they mixed the records up and they operated, they did the wrong operation on her. It happens sometimes. Everyone's fallible, even scientists, believe it or not. So generally it's expected that people come out of a hospital in better shape than they go in. And not uh, economically, but the doctor goes in and comes and goes out better economically, and definitely the owner of the hospital comes out. But it's presumed that it's doing something tangible to help people. And as we often used to get upbraided by righteous members of the public here in India, but what are you doing for people? Why don't you open a hospital and schools and do something, do something practical for the people like me? I, I contributed for a bus shelter so that people, they can stand in the shade and when they reach my factory, they're not already exhausted and they can work harder and make me more profit. Oh, excuse me, I didn't mean to say that. Uh, these, these philanthropists, they contribute for building new schools. The great, work they're doing so they have more people to uh, choose from in their workforce and they can pay them less and then squeeze them out to the max and when they collapse they can just get another one and this is called philanthropy opening schools to help people so uh, here Srila Prabhupada has written philanthropists and altruists do not realize that it is impossible to improve people's material conditions This statement, along with the statement which came in yesterday's purport, the one that was read yesterday, Srila Prabhupada states that, uh, where is that statement? As far as the material body is concerned, we cannot do anything for anyone. Now these statements, they don't seem to tally with observable reality. Talabhyade dukavad anyatasukam kalena anyatra gabhira ranghasa. Well, that's, oh, no, no, that's actually another verse, isn't it? Yeah. One, one should uh, endeavor for that which cannot be attained, even by wandering up to the heaven, the highest planets and going all over the universe. Uh, because in this world, sukam indra kam daitya, deha yogena, what is that? Deha yogena, dehina. How does it go? Anyway, it's the same purport as this verse. Sukam indra. That uh, happiness and distress, they come without, sometimes, Sometimes we get something desirable without trying for it. 
Sometimes we get something undesirable. We don't attempt, we don't, we, we, we think, why did it happen to me? I was just doing my, just going about my business as I do every day and then all of us, I was just walking over the road and then all of a sudden a car swerved and hit me and I went to hospital, which was opened by a philanthropist. Why did it happen to me? Well, it all happens because Purusha Sukha Dukkanam Bhuktit Vehitur Jite. We make our own destiny by our activities. And we can't get out of this cycle. You make, they try and make the body healthy. Yes, some, these, these, such statements are made that you can't do anything to help the body. And on the, on the other hand, there are other statements such as that which is, I believe, from Hitopadesh, which Srila Prabhupada stated that, that, Nahi Subtasya Singhasya Pravishanti Mukhaimrigam. Where's that from? You're nodding there, Shrutakiri, you learned that? Is that from Hitopadesh, where you taught that in your Sanskrit class? You heard it before. That the animal, the deer, doesn't come up to the sleeping lion and say, my dear lion, uh, I'm your breakfast. He doesn't do that. The lion, he has to get up and chase the, uh, the deer or whatever. And then he gets his breakfast. So the, the, the implication is, and, and Krishna also says something similar that, Sharira yatra pichate naprasedhyata karmanaha. Even to maintain the body, even to go on with life in this world, in this body, you can't attain perfection in that or you can't fulfill that by not working. So everyone has to do some kind of work. So both considerations, uh, they, they, they seem to be opposing, uh, but the fact is that uh, although Purusha Sukha Dukkanam Bhuktite Hetu Ruchite that we make our own happiness and distress but everything is going on under the direction of Krishna and through Krishna's uh, energies he's overseeing all of this. So we may get material happiness at some point and that will be followed by distress and that will be followed by happiness and that will be followed by distress. It goes in cycles like this. And when we say happiness, there's, there's no unmixed happiness. There's always some distress, even in the heavenly planets. And even in the hellish planets, there's also some happiness. You're condemned to a river, live in a river of stool and pus. And you get used to it and you think, oh, that's nice. Oh, look at that piece of pus floating over there. I get it quicker than the other person who's trying to get it. They take pleasure in hellish enjoyment. That's stated in the Bhagavatam. They actually take pleasure in hellish enjoyment. And we see that also. The pig is very happy to eat stool. You'll see two big pigs. Someone passes stool and he has a stick there so they don't... In the field. He has a stick there to keep the pigs away. But as soon as he gets up, the, the pigs will be running and trying to get each other out of the way to get that stool. I think it was the first time I went to Vrindavan. No, it was the second. I did Vrindavan Parikama. In those days, it was all uh, kacha paths. The, 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 now it's the highway, the Vrindavan Parikama. So, this is about, I guess, about six o'clock in the morning. So I was going around and then uh, there was a house... And on the first floor on the veranda, a little boy came out, parked himself down, and pop, 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 pop. And the, uh, the hog was there. He had his daily regular timing. And some was going all over his face. The first time I'd seen it, so it was quite, it made a sun scar, deep sun scar, deep impression in my mind. That you don't see that kind of thing in good old England, where I'd come from. You don't see it in India now, if you live in the city. 
So the pig was, you know, great, you know, fresh, hot, tasty. And uh, he likes that chili flavor probably. Uh, yeah. Indians eat lots of chili. So you get, you know. The pigs in Andhra Pradesh must be in ecstasy. They got <laughs> so much chilies. But they think it, that's the point. They think it's happy. They think it's nice. They like it. It's hellish. It's completely hellish. That's a punishment for a human to be forced to eat stool. That's a punishment. Unless you're Frank Zappa. Who knows where he is now? One of those pigs probably. Because you get what you aim for. You know that? Frank Zappa, Ed Stool, one of his, one of his tricks. Yeah. Well, so I heard someone because they're trying, they're all trying to outdo each other in, in gross degradation. So someone passed stool on stage. And then to outdo him, Frank Zappa, edit. This is, so we've heard. So, if you haven't heard the name Frank Zappa, then 99% of your life is saved, <laughs> not spoiled. So we're supposed to be talking about Krishna here, but we have to go through many, many, many uh, layers of peeling off all varieties of misconceptions before we can properly reach Krishna. Bharat Maharaj he was so, seemed to be so close to Krishna, but there was still something in his heart which pulled him down. The noble desire to help a deer. So the noble desire to, it, 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 to help people on the bodily platform. How far do you go? What do, how far should you get involved? If you're, Walking on the street and you see someone is attacking someone else. Should you get involved or not? It happened a few years ago in Belgium. One of our devotees saw a, a, a thief attacking someone else and he went to, a, to protect. He had nothing to do with either of the people. He got involved and then the thief slashed him with a knife and the, the last I heard he was fighting for his life in, the devotee was fighting for his life in hospital. Should you get involved or not? Should we be callous to all these things? These are very difficult questions which may be difficult to answer in, in from, they'll vary from situation to situation. If you see, uh, the common example given in the Western world, if you see an old woman and she, she's, struggling to cross the road because she can only walk very slowly and there's a lot of traffic. You might just go in the street and halt the traffic so she can cross. You might do a small thing like that. Or if you see, it often happens to me, you see some elderly person and on the, going on the plane and they're, they're having difficulty putting their bag up in the rack. So you just take it and pick it up. But how far do you go with that? If he invites you home to his house and how far do you go? It's, if you can do something easily without getting entangled, what's the harm? It's, uh, we're not, so, as Srila Prabhupada translates this here, even though one is in the renounced order, who, one who is advanced certainly feels compassion for suffering living entities. That means you don't become so renounced that you just leave the world. People say you're being irresponsible. There, there are duties to perform here in the world, to help the world. Why have you left? So in the renounced order, one just leaves the world. Never mind what's happening. Let it go its own way. Someone might... That, that Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur was charged. It was, it was accused by Nitaji, Subhash Chandra Bosch. Why are you taking all these young men for your Goryamut? They should be fighting for the liberation of India. So... Even though one is in the renounced order, one should feel compassion for others. And that doesn't mean that one is totally callous to people's material needs. If you can help that, 
without getting entangled. But how far do you go? You get entangled. And then we find in our movement there the are big op- multi craw operations for feeding school children with meals. Now, definitely there's a lot of devotee effort and um, endeavor going in, yeah, and going into that, which could have been channeled into giving people Srila Prabhupada's books, for instance. Uh, what's the payoff? Well, we say people become inclined or they become favorable to our movement. There, there, there are so many pros and cons to be considered. At the same time, we to raise funds for this and to get the f- uh, f- favorable uh, or to, to get the favor of people, we have to present that, yes, we're very compassionate towards the children, we're trying to help them. And if we ask devotees, they say, well, we're just doing it because we're trying, you know, so the people will think well of us. Well, that's hypocrisy, isn't it? You say we're trying to help the children, but you don't really care about the children, you just want to get some public favor. What is that? That's hypocrisy, isn't it? That's what they tell us. But in public they say, well, we're helping the children and we really have to help them and this and that. But they don't. Either either they are thinking like that, that we really want to help the children and give them a good start in life so they can get a job in some polluted factory and get lung cancer at an early age. Um, <clears throat> so either they are thinking like that, which is... Uh, completely uh, mundane way of thinking or they're being hypocritical hypocritical about it and they're, they're just saying that to get money from people and get public favor so either way one is caught in maya <laughs> it's uh, so how far do you go do we should we feed hungry people yes we should feed hungry people but how uh, how far do we go? Srila Prabhupada, uh, if we examine his instructions, it seems quite clear that he wanted uh, distribution at his temples. He said that no one should go hungry within 10 kilometers. Um, within 10 kilometers of our temple. That might suggest that there's some out taking out because not everyone can walk 10 kilometers every day to take a meal. So we're so within a certain sphere, but then specifically should it be for school children? What about their parents? Are they hungry too? Should it be promoted that we are doing so to build a nation? That's not Krishna conscious philosophy, building the nation. It might be Krishna conscious if the, if there was a king like Yudhishthir, but if there was a king like Yudhishthir, there wouldn't be, uh, there wouldn't be hungry children anyway. That's the, it's actually the king's duty to organize, not sadhus. It's not the duty of of sadhus and brahmanas to arrange. They may do so on an emergency basis, but not on a on a full time basis. So there are there are pros and cons in this discussion. Here, Srila Prabhupada is warning us, in the example of Bharat Maharaj, be careful. Don't get entangled in that. And then your consciousness changes because if you keep on saying, if you go out every day with a briefcase making collection that we're helping the children have a better, you start to believe it yourself. <laughs> Sangat Sanjayate Kamaha. You keep on saying it and you, you start to think. Yeah. So some warnings are there. Yeah, any question about this? Yeah. Don't they feed them prasadam? Don't they feed them prasadam? Uh, we're told that they feed them prasadam. Although, it may not always be so. I was, I was told by someone who told me that he had been told by one of the cooks who'd worked there that many times they don't. They're, they're, they're a, they have a tight time schedule. They're often in a hurry. And 
they don't bother or they just forget or whatever. They may do. They, Srila Prabhupada's instruction is there in one letter that simply giving them food is nonsense. There must be kirtan and spiritual instruction also. When he was addressing the issue of feeding poor children, he said that simply giving food is nonsense. So, if we're to follow properly what Srila Prabhupada did, then we should give kirtan and, and instruction also. And even if it is prasadam, these things should be there also. But on the whole, it, it should be presented as prasadam also, which you're not able to do in this secular school atmosphere Shila of India today. Um, Srila Prabhupada instructed that in our restaurants it should be, there should be a sign telling people that this is Krishna Prasad in the West, telling them what it is, so they don't think that they're just eating ordinary food. There's one devotee in just south of Chennai, there in M.M. Naga, he was in Delhi, and he was appointed as the head of one unit for preparing the midday meals there. And uh, he got fed up and left because the devotees, they didn't want him to go. They, they told him not to go in devotee clothes. No, You have to go in regular secular dress without tilak. And all the people you meet, you're not allowed to even let them know it's anything to do with Krishna consciousness. So he got fed up and he left. He didn't want to, they, they, they want to totally secularize because if there's any trace that it's anything to do with Krishna consciousness, then it goes against the government principle of, of absolute separation of government and religion. Well, except for giving grants to Christian schools. Christians, they can do. They can. Anyway, that's another issue. But... Hmm. Yeah. I should get a little, sun, a little sunshine. You didn't use the word straight jacket, but you said they have a path in life that they can follow and that they use security and some of the People are clamoring now for freedom, but there is a, there is an old saying that uh, if you give a fool enough rope, then he can easily he, 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 he hang himself. Yeah. But isn't that the problem with the world today? Is to just think any willy nilly thing I want to do, I should have the freedom to do it. Whereas maybe culture is such that it directs us in our own. Way. Well, definitely in Vedic culture there's a lot less freedom than people think they have in the modern world today. As I gave that example of Solzhenitsyn who came from Russia to America, he said that both in Russia and America people are slaves. The difference is that in Russia they know they're slaves. So... There are different values. The values of liberty, egalite, fraternity. They are not there in... Could you hear that? That's French. Liberty, egality. It's almost the same in English. Um, they are not values of practically all... And there's practically no society prior to pre-revolutionary France that had such values. It was just accepted everywhere that there is a hierarchy. There are some people who are born in the higher class and they have authority. And in the Christian world, the, the, there's that saying, you, you have to accept your lot. And within Vedic culture, there was this far more sophisticated understanding of that we get our situation according to what we do in previous lives. And that if we act within our present situation, that we can uh, become elevated in another life, in our next life. 
So this idea that that is uh, accepted as particularly as the uh, raison d'être, to use a little more French, the, uh, the 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 reason for existence of or, or the underlying principle of the American way of life is that everyone should have as as much opportunity, full opportunity to pursue personal pleasure. Pull, you pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Although there's, there is significantly less opportunity in modern America than there used to be in the frontier days and pushing toward the West and all. And, and even this, um, there are some recent examples, the Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, the Google crew, there are some examples. Um, but the idea that uh, you should have full opportunity to... What is that? On one notebook I have it, it... There's a motto. There's the kind of thing they're drilling into Indian school children nowadays. Be all that you can. But the Vedic outlook is, is very different. It's... It, it emphasizes spiritual success rather than material success, which is meaningless anyway, because we're, we're just come into this world and with, within a snap of the fingers, practically, the, the life is over and we go to another life. So this uh, verse, Talabhyate Dukha Vadanyata Sukham, how does that verse begin? That, that gives... Uh, no, I'm getting much the second. Kalena Sarvatra Gabhira Rangasa. Teta Kovido. Upriyada. It's a long time since I. Yad Brahmatam Upriyada. Yeah, that one should not waste his time in going around and round, up and down in this material world trying to improve one's position, uh, one should endeavor for that which cannot be obtained by going up and down in this world. One should endeavor for that which is beyond this world. So, it's a completely different outlook on life. And that's why I think, and I, I'm... I f feel I can invoke the modus operandi of our acharyas in this, that they, they, in preaching Krishna consciousness, they made clear that it's something very, very different. If you try to present it as something as part of this world, then inevitably we'll just merge back into this world. We have to make it clear. This Krishna consciousness it's not meant for material improvement, which is, human life is not meant for that, because it's very short, and within this short time we have to make advancement in spiritual consciousness. Bharat Maharaj, he made such an, he had such a material position, he just left it, because he wanted, the, he understood what's really important. So that's our preaching. And even if we don't get thousands and thousands of people to come, if, if a few people come, or even one, or even no one comes, <laughs> we have to tell people what they really need rather than what they like to hear. It's a very dangerous policy, telling them what they like to hear instead of what they need to hear. And then once you start, then there's no end to it. And we're seeing that within our movement now with... with Bollywood dances at Rathiatra. People like it. Say, people, I don't like it. I don't think any person, I'm not saying I'm particularly cultured, but I don't think anyone of any, I mean, even Australians aren't generally known for being highly cultured, although that is a stereotype. There are many, I mean, by Western standards, very intelligent, learned, and cultured people in Australia. They had this Bollywood dance at the Melbourne Rathiatra. So I, I think anyone of uh, the little higher culture, even from even from the Western point of view, would not 
would not be attracted to that. It's only very people of very low class tendencies would be at, would be attracted by Bollywood dancing. I say, well, it's Indian. Well, it doesn't mean that everything from India is high class. Kangsa was Indian also. One of the most famous people in the history of India, still known even today. Very powerful king. Isn't the problem, Maharaj, with, with uh, the Western world in particular is that they, they don't think philosophically? People don't think philosophically in the West. And even when they think philosophically, it's, it's, a, it's a university course. It's something to be studied. It's not that their life is not philosophical. One's whole approach to life should be philosophical, which is one reason we can say why Srila Prabhupada, following the tradition, instituted regular classes on Shastra, and he always spoke philosophically. Srila Prabhupada didn't speak to entertain. He didn't speak to make people feel good. He spoke philosophy that we need to hear, to set a philosophical tenor for our movement. But at many uh, festivals, both within the temple, which are supposed to be for devotees, and public festivals like Rathyatra, we find there's no lecture anymore. Did you see? There's no lecture, just some entertainment, that's all. No lecture. I was at a Rathyatra this summer in England, and I was giving a lecture, and there were all these people from the public who were coming and listening. And it was just, you know, straightforward philosophy that we're not the body and all that. And they were listening intently. All of a sudden, you have to stop now. It's time for a dance. Some, you know, some... I know it was young or old, because I just saw her from a distance. Some woman cavorting around in some purple outfit. So, I would say, for, for festivals like this, we should have kirtan lecture, kirtan lecture. We can also have dramas, which demonstrate the philosophy. But there's no need for... It's like I've been in Rathyaj in the West also, where the music is, they have kirtan, but it's all with this heavy rock music. No need for all this. Just, people already have heavy rock music, much better than any of our devotees can do. And better if you think it's good. Just, we have our own thing. We, we, why, why we have to, show, if people like, if they're into, let them come to Krishna conscious. Why do we have to present it as something else? I just saw that there's, there's a flyer given out. My, our one god brother, Mahavidya in England, he put this on the internet. There's a flyer given in Northampton, some nondescript town in South, South Midlands of England. So he was, he got a flyer which said Mantra Lounge. And there was a picture of a woman, a side profile with her chest forward so that her breast stuck, stuck out. And then the devotee worked out that by the names, like contact Goranga Das or something like this, it was actually our devotees. And they're inviting people to Mantra Lounge. And I thought that, okay, so people, who's going to be interested to go there? People interested in mantras, maybe mantras for getting some prostitute or something like this. Who's, if anyone's actually got any serious interest in spiritual life, would they go to such a thing? I don't think so. Why, why attract them with this? I mean, they, they, everything is sold, everything is marketed with beautiful young women. Why this? It, it's so uh, inapt and so much misrepresenting. I don't, we we should think in, in our endeavors to bring Krishna consciousness to others. We should think of the dignity of our sampradaya, of our acharyas, and we have Bollywood dances. And what is this? People think that we are some kind of funny people who sing in the streets. But we should let them know that we have a very grave philosophy. They should come to know that after 40 years of Krishna conscious in the way, more than, actually it's almost 50 years now, isn't it, of Krishna conscious in the West. People should come to know that, first of all, they should know that there is a Krishna conscious movement and they should know that we have a very grave philosophy that merits their, at least their 
considering it. In India also, people think, I'm over, uh, temples, you go, you look, you come out. People should know that we, we have philosophy. We, when we're talking about philosophy, we're not talking about something which some people do at school because they're not, they couldn't make it in the science stream. We're talking about what's really relevant in everyone's life. Even if you're not like, if you're not very intelligent or learned or educated, philosophy is for everyone because it concerns our existential position. And often we find that people who are not very well educated in the so-called modern education, they, they have very good understanding of philosophy because they're devotees and they take it seriously. And sometimes we find people who are very well educated, even they, they're good in their bhakti shastri and But they practically in their life, we don't see that they live the philosophy. So it's a fact that we're we're promoting philosophy, and philosophy is not a not a well loved subject in the modern world. It is, people are deliberately kept stupid. Once a devotee showed me a book. It was it was a tongue in cheek kind of book, and it said how to learn a primer of philosophy, so that when you go to a party, you can impress people at home. They just give a few points about philosophy. You can you learn a few lines from Rousseau and Francis Bacon and all these people, and then you can impress people. You know so much. They said, in the preface, it said, when we're talking about philosophy, we're not talking about the kind of things that some Hare Krishna might speak to you. If you, do, if you, say, if you meet them, don't try to discuss philosophy with them. I'm paraphrasing, of course, because that's real philosophy. For philosophy means, yes, and, uh, and, uh, Thomas Huxley said this, and he defeated the Christians, and this, Adam Smith said this, and like this. Sartre said this, and, oh yeah, very good, yeah. Well, actually, I'm a follower of the Vedanta. There's a, that said in the, the Lamrita, someone in 1965 or 6 came out to Prabhupada, came out to Prabhupada and said, oh, actually, I'm a follower of Vedanta. And Prabhupada said, but in, Vedanta, what do you know about Vedanta? What's the first sutra of the Vedanta Sutra? Tell me, tell me. The person had no idea. So like, they're like, I'm a follower of Vedanta. Yeah. People like to say, it's a hobby. For us, philosophy is not a hobby. You told me, I said, what was that, at Badrinath? I forgot about that. At Badrinath, the, 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 that Nambudri priest, he, he saw we're all, we're Vaishnavas, and so he read out the Gopi Gita from the Bhagavatam. I don't remember this, you just told me this the other day. And I said to him, for you... Yeah, I, I said this, this, yeah, this contradicts your whole philosophy. And then what else I said for There was some discussion going on. Anyway, it's all jugglery of words. He said. He said it's all jugglery of words. And I said, I said to him that for you it is, for us it's our, it's our life, yeah. For him it's just a, he left at that point. I didn't remember all of that. You remember that. Shabda Jala Maharanyam Chitta Brahmana Karanam. That's what they think. Words are just a big net which is the cause of confusion, which comes in the Vivek Churamani, which is words. So it's, it's a book, it's all words. Hare Krishna, enough words. Here for now. Sivon Mukhe Hi Jivada. One thing, one function of the tongue is to speak and another is to honor prasad. So, time for all of you to honor prasadam. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Thank you, Haribada Prabhu. When we say Haripada, that means plus better half. It's in, it's included. Thank you for coming. Hare Krishna.